Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the Silicon Roundabout podcast series. Um, we are joined today uh, by an awesome guest. So, and and we'll talk about that and I'll explain to you guys why that this is. So the person joining us today is actually a doctor, Gerard Fitzpatrick. And I can't, he's, he's the director of engineering from Waveflyer. And honestly, York, do you prefer doctor? Do you prefer Gerard? What do you prefer us to call you? Literally, no one has ever called me doctor in my life. <laughs> ever since I got my PhD, it's one of the big disappointments about getting a PhD is that people don't tend to ever call you doctor. Have, have you tried to, to you know, to sort of impose that? So, like, I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor. I have earned that title. Because I, I, mean, I didn't I, see I, it in your profile, on your profile. <laughs> I couldn't see it. So I had I not gone through it, I wouldn't have possibly guessed. <laughs> I mean, I, I have said it occasionally for, for laughs, but um, not really ever in any kind of seriousness. Um, well, this is, this, is, this is how it gets even more exciting. So, uh, Gerard hasn't actually just got a PhD. Let's, let's, I'd like to talk about the profile first, because you come from a physics background. Yeah, yeah. So, my background is specifically in astrophysics. In astrophysics. Okay, so you've, and your PhD, and this is actually, guys, this is, a mouthful, literally. So, Gerard has got a PhD, a doctor of philosophy, in the studies of high energy atmospheric phenomena with the Fermi gamma ray burst monitor. I'm gonna just, you know, Break it I down. have no idea. <laughs> I, okay, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Please take, so, take the floor is yours, Gerard. So, in uh, in, in large. Um thunderstorms, you can get acceleration of electrons that give off intense bursts of high energy radiation. This is a phenomenon known as terrestrial gamma ray flashes. And I have to say, it's quite funny that I, I never thought I'd ever speak about this again <laughs> to anybody. Um, so in, in essence, when you get electron acceleration, you can get um, energy given off in the form of bremsschaden, which is uh, German for breaking radiation. So what this means effectively is that every day, um, all over the planet, but particularly around the tropics, we have short, intense bursts of gamma rays going off in the atmosphere. And we can see these. Um, in my case, we used a, a telescope, which was put into space to observe the universe. But actually, the design of it meant that it picked up these emissions from Earth. So I was doing space-based observations of terrestrial phenomena. And it's, these are actually super interesting, um, like genuinely interesting. So what you get is an intense burst of uh, photons, which are, um, gamma ray um, energy photons in microseconds. So you might have like a, a time profile which might last anywhere from 50 to a couple hundred um, microseconds. So like far less than a millisecond, and like microsecond like is one millionth of a second. So in a like in a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second, you're getting so many high energy photons just flying through the atmosphere every day, and, and nobody knows really. <laughs> it's um. It's a it's quite a niche thing. Um, not a lot of people know about it. It's uh, technically speaking, it falls into geophysics. My background is in astrophysics, and when I was in university, I worked with the uh, Fermi team. So Fermi is a NASA satellite. So I did um I did my final year project in in uni with that team, and and then I spent a couple of months over there before doing like an internship in NASA before I did my masters. And my master's was on um, observation by telescope. And I just kind of grew into that. So you've basically touched upon that. Um, mm. The most interesting thing probably here, and you've just casually touched upon it. You were in NASA. Whether it was a yeah. day, whether it was a week, whether you were in NASA. You, 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 you were there. So not only have I had you're probably the first doctor of physics I've ever actually spoken with. <laughs> Hopefully my younger brother is soon to be one. He's actually about to start that in the summer. Uh, but you're the very first person. I'll probably, you're probably the only person I've ever come across who has actually been part of NASA, worked at NASA, just been involved with NASA. What was that like? And that is probably one of the most interesting things anybody, everybody would agree on. So I have also... Um... Not to toot my own horn, but when I was an undergraduate, I spent a couple of months working with the European Space Agency. So I went over to um, Madrid for a summer, and, and I, I worked in ESAC, so one of the, the centers. They have several centers across Europe. So I worked with ESA, and I worked with NASA, and I found them both very interesting. You know, NASA has a certain rep reputation, uh, and there's some fantastic people there. 
Um, you know, quite often the work you do, the, like how exciting and how incredible it is, is a function of the people you're working with, really. Um, and sometimes I think that, you know, there's a certain status which goes along doing something with NASA, which I don't think necessarily represents the truth. There are fantastic people all over the, the world, right, and in different centers. And I think sometimes we have a tendency to focus on, like, the brand of NASA or whatever. I mean, it was fine. I enjoyed myself. I worked with some fantastic scientists. Um, I worked actually, so there's um, there's a number of NASA centers in the U.S. Um, the the one I worked with, when I was associated with, was down in Alabama. So not many really, not many people know this. This is one of my favorite things about little bits of trivia I picked up. Um, there's a um, NASA center in Alabama, um, close to the really? border with Tennessee. Yeah, it's the uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center, and it's where they built the rockets that went to the moon. And um, like, okay, yeah, you learn something new every day. I had app. I mean, I've, I had no idea. Literally, no uh, idea. So um, uh, that's where I, I spent them. Um, like at a, at a certain point, obviously, I, I moved away from this physics and I, I joined the real world and became. Yeah, that engineer. was going to be the next point. As in, how, how do you go from literally a doctor of physics being a, space, literally astrophysics? <laughs> you're studying space. Yeah. How does how how does the transition happen into tech? Uh, so for me, it happened because um, uh, so the academic world is, um, in many ways, it's it's incredible. You have an awful lot of freedom to define your own work. Um, you get a lot of like it can be quite fun to do research for the for the sake of research. There's something very freeing in that. Um, I found that after a certain point, so I finished my PhD, um, and then I, I I worked a little bit as a scientist and. I was actually working in America, um, but I had decided that I had reached the end of the road with academia. Um, it can be tough to um, get a permanent position. Uh, it can You generally fall into the cycle of having to continually apply for funding to get the next year's money. And I didn't really enjoy that. And I was kind of looking forward to um, move to something like more interesting, which might seem kind of ironic. Um, because people tend to think physics is very interesting. What I was doing was interesting, but I had always um, been really excited about joining a product team and, and growing something. And it's something that I I have a love for physics that goes back to when I was a kid in high school. But over over the years, I, I realized that I, I went down this path of physics because I wasn't really sure what else to do, rather than having been super passionate about it. I I, did, I now that I'm out of that world, I do enjoy physics again. But I think at a certain point, I realized that I, I would just like to work on something a bit more concrete, a bit more real. Um, a lot of and abstractions. That's how happened. Yeah. So I mean, what happened was I reached a point where I was I was looking for something new, something different. Um, and I had a couple of friends who had who had moved into tech. I got chatting to them, and it seemed really exciting. Actually, one of my um, one of the people I was in in uni at, he ended up in Google. Um, so we kind of went on, on parallel paths. We both did um, an internship with the European Space Agency. We both did a research master's. I did a PhD, and then he went to Google. Um, and just talking about the, you know, the the opportunities in tech, to the, the opportunities to, you, you know, like grow a product and to iterate and deliver something with value, it just sounds really exciting. So, um, I when I finished my PhD, I worked for a little bit, and then I started looking for new opportunities. Um, one of the biggest challenges I had was um, uh, converting what I had done and, and making it relevant to folks. So I had it calls about hiring managers where um, they're like, you sound really interesting, but we're not really sure what you can do. And I was like, I'm not really sure what I can do either, but I, I'm sure if you just give me a chance. So I, yeah, one of the difficulties that folks that my background have is, is making that transition and proving that they are, you know, A, not institutionalized by academia, um, and B, can deliver value. Eventually, I found um, I found a good fit with a startup, um, which was in the data science space. Um, it's fairly common for people with my background to make that move initially into data science. So I worked there for a little bit. We were we described ourselves as a boutique management consultancy firm. That's how we pitched it. Um, in reality, it was um, I mean that was the reality. Um, boutique just makes it sound kind of fancy. Um, so I worked there for a little bit, did, did some data science. Then we, we pivoted um, and became a, a data science, um, essentially data science as a service. So that company is still around and doing very well. So I was a software engineer there. 
Um, I had made that pivot m more formal, so I moved out of data science into software engineering um, and began the process of like scaling that company, that product. Uh, and that continued. Um, it was super exciting. Um, it's going really well. The challenge for me was I had just in I just real desire to like grow a product, um, move into a a more conventional SaaS space, uh, and and really like experience like like massive growth. I really wanted to have the opportunity to grow something massively. Uh, data science as a as a service, even when backed by an internal product, which is what we had, is not going to hit that kind of growth, um, or at least not for a while. So that brings us to Wayfire. So the opportunity arose for a couple of us in in that company to spin out a new company, and so we did that in um, we did that in uh, from I, your I old guess. company. The opportunity sort of brought itself. Yeah. So in essence, the CEO of Wayfire um, had this idea at the time. He was the CEO of the other company, and he he had this idea to get involved to take what we had learned through our data science and our digital marketing expertise and apply it to the world of, of e-commerce companies. And that's how basically and Wayflyer was that's born. How, that's how Wayflyer was born. So what so Wayflyer, what is Wayflyer then? Exactly. What what let's yeah. let's talk to it. Because you guys have been making some noise in the news. Yeah. You have been making quite a bit of noise. Yes, probably not many people at you know at this stage have probably heard of Wayflyer, but you know, I'm I'm sure a number of them have. But even if they did, I'm not sure, you know, they they know exactly what you guys do, except that you're making a lot of noise and you're raising <laughs> and you're raising funding. You've just raised a huge funding round. So yeah. what is Wayflyer? Let's talk about that. You've hit the nail on the head. So fundamentally, I, do, I think the way to talk about Wayflyer is to talk about what our mission is. And it's really quite simple. We're in the business of helping e-commerce companies grow. Now, fundamentally, we want to help promising e-commerce companies and established e-commerce companies either grow or continue to grow. And we do this through a hybrid approach of providing financing and, and, and analytics. So analytics provides the confidence to spend and finance provides the capital to spend. Um, so what that means in essence is we can help uh, promising companies and established companies grow through um, financing. And what we'll do is we'll help them understand how to best spend that money to get the maximum return from that spend. The reason for this is, is, is quite simple. So e-commerce companies struggle to scale. Um, usually um, they don't have many assets and they get quite honestly pretty brutal payment terms on their inventory. So what this means is like, for, like to give you a concrete example, you're as a, you're an e-commerce company and, and your things are going well and you're getting ready for Black Friday and you're ordering a shipment from your provider and say your provider happens to be in China. To get ready for Black Friday, you probably have to fork out 30% of um, the order in September when you make it. And then when the order is complete in October, you've got to pay the remaining 70% before it's ever shipped to you. So before you have any product in hand, you've already spent 100% of the cost. Uh, and what's more, now you need to spend money on digital marketing. So it can be very before hard. Single for, sale, literally. Exactly, right? So it's you know it's october and you spent the cost of your 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 product you spent you know a decent chunk of money on marketing uh and, and like so that, that limits the growth of companies you know like uh, the access you know if you're an e-commerce company and things are going well and you want to accelerate growth there's two levers to pull there's you know inventory and then there is digital marketing like both of these things will will, will drive your 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 revenue and your growth and that's where we come in so what we do is we work with companies in the US, Ireland, the UK, and Australia um, to help them grow. So companies can come along, they can apply to our site, um, and they can connect their, their various you know, e-commerce shopping platforms, and we'll, we'll pull down the data, we'll do some predictive modeling, get a sense of the growth, and if they're ready for funding, we can help them out. If they're not ready, we'll, you know, we'll get them some analytics, get them going, and when they are ready, we'll reach back to them. And the, the kind of financing we provide, it's called a merchant cash advance. And what it equates to is effectively um, a merchant is selling us their future sales. So there's there's no security, which makes it promising or makes it appetizing for an e-commerce company. So you can imagine a case, I'm, I'm selling my shoes online, my store is doing great, I need money to scale. I come to Wayflyer, I can demonstrate that my company is doing well and that I'm on the cost of growth. I just need a little bit of help. Wayfire can give my company, say, a hundred grand, hundred thousand pounds, and what we'll do is, um, 
that will transfer that that money will arrive to the customer and then wayfire will begin collecting uh, every day as a percentage of the, the daily sales um our money back until they pay it back and so what that means is that there's a really like it's a really really sweet thing here is that like our customers performance and, and our 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 like our customers and our interests are tied together when a customer does well we get our money back sooner when a customer goes through a tough period of time maybe you know maybe a shipment gets seized by customs for example maybe something doesn't get delivered they're not on the hook for a lot of money because because we're taking a percentage of their sales they're ready to wait and that creates a really really beautiful relationship between us and our customers that's that that, that sounds like an absolutely ideal model for any um e-commerce business really um yeah they're not really at risk they're getting the right from the sound of it you are you're doing is not you're not just giving them the funding but you're consulting them on how best to spend it what yeah so like we we, we believe strongly that you know um finance alone is not enough to to really thrive in this market and you need to provide additional services and we we believe that analytics is how we can do this and so you know like it's you can imagine a case where you you have an e-commerce company and maybe you're even moderately big and you're doing quite well a lot of companies are going to struggle to spend a large chunk of cash on digital marketing with, without any you know advice or guidance so, and so we believe like really strongly that like a hybrid approach of finance and analytics is how we'll succeed. And how do you, people will ask, the first question mm -hmm. people ask, how do you help them financially? So are you guys like a, a fund? Do you have, where are you able to, you know, uh, how are you able to help them? That's, that's, I suppose, a question. Yeah. So, so we have access to a debt fund that, that we use in essence. So, oh, so, we, you, so you have access to a fund and then you always look, this is how you use that, mm -hmm. the money to help out organizations who you determine are able to, you know, make that journey, take that loan basically, but yeah. in a safe way. Uh, well, so what we do is we help companies that, that promising companies with, with growth by capital in essence. And so, you know, the really key thing here is that like e-commerce companies of all sizes, so we finance people who want 10,000 pounds up to those who want closer to 10 million pounds. So like the financing that we give is a function of the size of the company. So we don't work with just small promising companies. We work companies of all sizes. And just to highlight, to double check here and highlight to the audience, you don't actually have, uh, or you don't take any ownership of that business, any shares or anything like that. No, no, that's not a, there's no equity requirements. There's no security. It's a, a chunk of cash that we collect until you pay back. Sounds like an absolutely, absolutely sweet, 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 sweet deal, basically. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it is what it is. Um, there are, you know, there are, the, the, it's very, very beneficial to founders of companies, you know, like, so if you're a founder and you're looking to grow, like you probably don't want to give out equity in your company at an early stage, if you're looking to grow of course. and you probably also don't want to take, like, you probably don't have the security to get a loan from a traditional bank. And so that's why you can come to us for financing. Sounds great. So how you said the opportunity presented itself while you were with your previous employer, but mm. I don't think we've touched upon it. When did that actually happen? It's I think what's interesting here, what's so cool about Waveflyer is the rate at yeah. which things have happened. So to put that into perspective, tell us about that. When did that actually happen? And sort of the journey from then till today basically right so you know in essence in in january 1st we had a single customer um, J january 2020 had one customer yeah okay so in january 2020 uh, you know i think we were seven people um and we had one customer and we had an idea and it seemed to have promise um now we're at a point where i, I think i've actually lost count i, I do believe the most recent headcount was 45 people working directly for Wayfire and we have hundreds of customers. And what's more, we have thousands of people who've come onto our platform and applied. You, and you've given grown by more than five, six times, basically. The, yeah, the it's, been, it's been phenomenal. Um, and uh, we're gonna continue to grow next year. Um, we have a lot of work to do. It's super exciting. Um, you know, like this, this growth has been, um, I, I mean, like, it's hard to express how exciting it is to grow oh, crazy um, that's how it is it's, so it's, successful. it's out of this world it's it's fantastic it's just makes believe you've just 
literally five, six times, you grew this, just the headcount. We're just yeah. discussing headcount itself. And then you went from one customer to hundreds, as they say, mm -hmm. in a span of less than 12 months, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, it's all happening in the backdrop of COVID-19 um, as well. So it's been... Which is, you know, the biggest probably catastrophe, uh, financial catastrophe the, the world has gone through since probably the Second World War. Yeah, it's been it's been like phenomenal. Um, and and of course, so you know, for us, it was it's been a real journey. So you know, in February, we decided to put our foot down and start to begin the process of scaling and growing and refining our product, just in time for a global pandemic to roll across. You know, first, you know, the world. Um, and so for us, that was you know, initially we weren't really too sure what, what the impact was going to be, and you know. Really, do we want to be trying to finance companies at this time and we're not sure what's going on? But what we've actually found pretty quickly is that, you know, the demand for, for e-commerce actually rose. And so you can see that Shopify has done a tremendous growth in the last 12 months as, as traditional brick and mortar stores try to move online as quickly as possible, try and tap into, you know, in essence, a changing demand. Um, the the, the size. The size yeah. of the market as well is just tremendously big. There are so many e-commerce companies out there who are who could be helped by by fire, you know. So, like, I think the growth is only just beginning. Uh, so, I think I'm gonna have an equally busy year next year. Why fly out today? Okay, mm. not just from a headcount perspective or from numbers of customers perspective, but as a company, as a product, as mm. a service, how different is it now compared to January? Almost twelve months later. So it's completely different. I think in essence, the core was there and the, the core idea behind what we would do, which is that help identify time facing companies and established companies and then help them grow. Like that's the core idea hasn't really changed. You know, when we started out, our mission was to help e-commerce companies grow. And along the way, we weren't sure what the balance would be between financing and, and, and analytics. And I think over time, what we've done is refine that. You know, the experience from a, from a user point of view is completely different, um, but the core principle of the product hasn't really changed. I think that's part of the reason we've had so much success that we just got a, you know, in essence, got a tremendous fit from a very early stage. So it's been exciting. It's mm -hmm. been incredible. But has it been without challenges? I mean, this is a, one of the biggest challenges humanity has faced, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have you guys faced any? Um, well, I mean, there's or has um, it just been smooth sailing so far? I mean, I don't want to say it's been smooth sailing. It's been tremendous work and tremendous hard work from the whole company and um, everywhere, you know, so we've 45 plus incredibly talented people um, who work extremely hard to make this happen and uh, overcome tremendous challenges on a daily to weekly basis. Um, in terms of some of the, the big challenges that we're facing, um, Really, um, you know, COVID is a challenge for anybody who's trying to grow a startup at this time. For us, it actually meant to not be, it was, you know, initially it took us a bit of a while to understand what the impact would be, just like the rest of the world. But the fact that it drove more people online and created more e-commerce companies it meant on some level that it wasn't that big a challenge for us. There's been some, you know, knock-on effects as of course now, you know, like our whole business is, is based around identifying promising companies and that's a lot more challenging because the behaviors are changing so rapidly you know COVID has has caused a, a mass change in behavior and a mass change in the supply demand cycle for e-commerce companies that is not representative of previous years which means that you know your predictive analysis um gets a lot harder understanding what the growth is going to be like in future you know so like this company has tremendous growth. Is it a function solely of COVID or is it additional factors eating in there? But for us, the, um, the, the real challenge has been like the, keeping up with the demand and the growth, you know, um, like the, to undergo this kind of expansion, um, when you have a core idea and then to maintain the culture and the discipline that let you grow initially while you scale is really challenging. Um, that's our biggest challenge. That's my biggest challenge is to make sure that I've got a fantastic team of folks working with me. Um, and we've got a fantastic culture 
and we need to make sure that as we grow that we continue to you know maintain and help that culture flourish rather than you know just fill in the gaps as it were that's our big challenge really that kind of growth aspect of it you know how, how can you how do you grow from seven to 45 people while maintaining a core culture it's a lot of work and you have to be very careful how you hire absolutely what's um on on that specific note on that specific note because obviously the tech community uh it, it, it's filled with uh um, you know tech professionals uh these days a lot of them are looking for jobs worried about their current jobs yeah what is it about Wayflay at the moment that you, you, i mean you mentioned culture you mentioned you know great people working together but what is it about what is this culture that you know it helped you grow from seven to 45 in a span of a few months is it because uh people were just looking for jobs and it's a difficult market and they were just looking for some security or is it because they really wanted to get on board because there is something here so what do you tell what can you tell you know people out there because you are hiring at the moment you yeah. are and, and you're expanding and you want to grow so what is it why should those people other than the fact that you guys are doing a fantastic product and you're bringing something <laughs> great to life other than being part of that what is it about wayfly that makes it such a great place to be at so i think that there's a couple of things that have made us successful like one of them is obviously the the, the idea and, and and having it resonate so strongly with, with our with our users and our customers is obviously a sign of something good but in terms of managing the growth and creating a product that people want to use and creating a you know a real positive experience for folks you know one of the things that we're really keen is that you know when people come to us looking for financing that even if they're not ready we can still keep them engaged they still we can still provide value and people really appreciate that kind of like human touch um there's a couple of things that let us do this uh, and one of them really I, I mean i guess there's kind of three things um that, that i will consider important the first thing is that everybody is like tremendously ambitious um but in a special kind of way, you know, uh, you can work with ambitious people who aren't interested in growing the team as a whole, but everybody has this combination of, of like a real ambition to grow. Um, you know, we take work very seriously. We also, of course, we have a work life balance. It's very important to us. Um, but work is a big part of what people do and they're very team driven and they believe in the product. And lots of people who work with us really believe in, in this mission we have, which is to help e-commerce companies grow. So, the other thing is is ownership and transparency. And, you know, we're moving way too fast to not push decision making down to the folks on the ground. And so what this means is that like everybody in the company has as much context as they need to, to thrive and succeed. And it's really important that when everyone, everybody, and somebody on my team or someone on a sales team is facing like a tough decision, like they understand the full context of the business and they're able to make that decision. And and that transparency and ownership really lets us move fast. And that really resonates with folks as well. Um, and I guess the final thing is that, you know, it's a, you know, <laughs> at the risk of sounding like a little bit trite, like it's a, it's a pretty calm environment. So like we're growing rapidly, a lot of ambitious people, but it's not a fire, well, it's not a volatile like environment. Like folks come into work, they work hard uh, and then they go home. Uh, and this combination of like hiring the right people, with the right mentality, let them own the the work that they need to do, and basically getting out of their way it worked really well. So finding the right finding the right people to join your team. So in your case, when you say the right people, you're not just really looking for somebody who can get the job done. They need to really fit in with your vision, with what you're it's, doing. Exactly, exactly. And I think if they if they didn't, they they wouldn't try and succeed. This is ultimately what we need. Um, so you know like for us it's very important that when we're screening folks and, and we're chatting to folks that we're you know we're giving them the opportunity to understand how we work um just as much as we're digging into them because it's really important to us that the people come on board are invested in what we're doing of course because from the sound of it you're making them you know you're making it sound like anybody who's who joined you guys is technically you know they're part of this business and you're all and it may, yeah, might, might sound like a cliche but it is you are all in this one shape and you're all guiding it towards one direction everybody is fully invested in it yeah i mean like it sounds incredibly cliche but it's also kind of true <laughs> the thing is, and, it is like a cliche but the, the funny thing is not many places are like that i mean a lot of places claim to be yeah but not are really like that 
um i mean obviously in your guys case um evidence suggests that it is because this growth is phenomenal really yeah i i think that the growth that we have is, is a combination of the product and the people that we have working for us i think we need both of those things you can have a fantastic team and a bad product and you know you're never going to try it and you can have like a great product and a bad team and you can do okay but the combination of the two is what, what gives you explosive growth absolutely we've discussed challenges we've discussed a lot of things what do you foresee um upcoming challenges for you know for you guys for wayflyer uh for the e-commerce industry even if you like um going into 2021 well, I, I think that lots of e-commerce companies are going to continue to struggle with um, the demand changing up and down as a function of, of COVID, to be honest. Like we can see this already you know, in the UK is they're rolling out various lockdowns, which having impacts on, on different folks. You know, when there's a clear correlation between um, a lockdown and online demand, you know, so understanding really like what is sustainable growth and what is the function of an, a, a quite artificial situation created by a, a lockdown i understand that so they can really understand how they're going to grow um that's the part of the big one that to my mind the, the the other challenges that folks are going to face are, are, are the same ones so everybody who's migrated online is going to have to continue to understand um how it works online and, and navigate the domestic business of digital marketing themselves and, and being effective in this you know so if you know Facebook ads, Google ads, these are all super important ways to, to grow your business and it's difficult to do um, well. And a, a challenge that a lot of companies fall into is that they identify a pattern that works and then they're, they find it difficult to iterate on that pattern. And why is that? Why, it, would, why would you say that? Well, it's quite simple. So you've got a channel that's driving 95% of your business. Um, do you want to mess with that? And that's the situation that business owners find themselves in, where like they, you might have a company, which is you know all in on Facebook ads and it's driving tremendous business, but they're also very exposed, and they're not really comfortable. Like perhaps they don't have the expertise in house, perhaps they're working with an agency who are doing it for them, but aren't really you know iterating on it. It's a real challenge. Um, those are the two that spring to mind anyway. <laughs> You're growing, we know that. Mm -hmm. Just quickly then, before we before before really uh, sort of wrap up the podcast, what what um, what teams for you guys are growing at the moment? And obviously, you as the director of engineering, Jay, what are you hiring within tech? Because this is probably the most relevant to our community. Yeah. So the first thing is we're hiring across the board. So we're hiring all departments. Sales. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> across the board. So we're hiring sales folks, marketing folks, customer success folks, um, and we're also specifically, in this case, hiring product folks. So um, we're looking right now, uh, we're hiring um, product engineers, um, data scientists, and data engineers. So we're looking for uh, all kinds of folks, to be honest. Uh, we're looking for full stack folks, we're looking for back end folks, we're looking for front end folks, looking for an engineering manager to spin up a new a new team, and um, looking for some data engineers to, to build some pipelines, we're looking for some data scientists to help out with, you know, the nitty gritty ML stuff that we need doing. You're looking for you're looking to make a lot of noise in the in in the in the second round of our community, tech community. Yeah. A lot of people are gonna be interested. For those okay, so let's just Say so let's get that out there. Uh, Jay will be joining us for an exclusive event uh, for Wayflyer coming up uh, towards the end of January, third, fourth week of January. We'll, we will set a date for that. And uh, that will be to talk about specifically the tech vacancies that uh, Wayflyer have. Get get proper tech with that. Th that's the event where we're going to get proper tech, uh, proper tech, sorry, um, talk about the roles, the try and answer as many questions for you guys as as possible so stay tuned that event will be very interesting uh it will be great to have Jer again uh one more time it'll be in the new year so um yeah it will we, we we hope hopefully we're all you know looking forward to a positive 2021 so fingers crossed uh lots of vacancies here to 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 get everybody in the community happy and buzzing yeah, fantastic. um Jer, look in what we do here in a traditional Silicon Roundabout uh, fashion, we don't mm. end the podcast until we ask some uh, some a bit of a 
interesting questions here where you, you okay. can't really dodge them. So okay. start, <laughs> try, trying to get people to know you a little bit, maybe a bit, a bit of the human side. So first of all, what's your favorite color? As cliche as that might sound. Yellow. Yellow. Why yellow? What, what is uh, it? Specifically you? like a deep mustard yellow. I just find Ooh, it nice. Deep mustard. Yeah. I've not heard that one before. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like, I don't really like a washed out yellow. Like a really deep mustard yellow is, is yeah, probably my favorite color. It just makes me feel happy. Nice, nice. What's your favorite thing to do on the weekend? So I've got two young kids. This is gonna sound super cliche. I got two young kids. I got an eight month old and a two and a half month, two and a half year old. I I love hanging out with my wife and my kids and going to the playground. It's yeah, it's we we we, we get some coffee. We walk around. We push the kids in the swing. Yeah, it's really quite pleasant and quite wholesome. That's quite nice. That's quite lovely. Yeah. <laughs> if if you were to be a cartoon character, or your favorite mm. cartoon character, who would that be? Who would you be? Oh my goodness! What what an interesting question. <laughs> oh my god! A cartoon character. That will take you back some time. Yeah. So um. Hmm. So I've got back into cartoons recently because my two and a half year old has started to watch cartoons. Ah, yeah. yeah, fair enough. Well, it's well before you say anything, let me just also tell you that we will ask why. Why? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So so far we're here. We watch uh, Frozen and um, Frozen One and Frozen Two. So I, I guess in some level that's what I'm drawing from because I haven't really watched many cartoons since then. Certainly from Frozen. I guess so, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, my daughter tells me that I'm Olaf. That's what she tells me. So <laughs> I, I guess I could go no, like, That was a question that got you thinking. Yeah. Question that got you thinking. <laughs> okay, quick one. iOS or Android? Um, I am Android uh, as of like six months ago, and I still can't use my phone. Um, really? I now, I now feel incredibly sympathetic for every time I was like short with my mom. Who couldn't use her new phone? Yeah, I I changed from um, iOS to Android. I just wanted to change pace. I've been iOS forever, and I just tried Android, and you know what? It's fine. Better, worse, or just just fine. Same thing. I mean, I I find like I I use my phone exclusively for for work pretty much. So it's like, can I write emails and can I read Slack? That's what I do on my phone. It's fine. Your favorite holiday location? What would that be? Hmm. I, I like the outdoors. Uh, I, I love hiking. Uh, I, again, like it's pretty, pretty traditional kind of thing. Um, so probably somewhere that has a nice climate, but also a nice nature to go for hikes. So which is like most of the world, to be honest. Um, but like some, quite, parts like North some, some parts of the world. So a lot of the world, I guess. I mean, like most places at some point in the year are decent weather. Um, I mean, maybe not so much Ireland where I'm from, but like a lot of other places. Um, so I would say, I mean, one I'm spot. Fond if you choose one, one particular spot. I really like North Italy. North Italy. Yeah, I mean, they have fantastic food. They have fantastic wine. They have fantastic scenics. I've not been, but that's definitely on my list. I've heard that before. That's definitely on my list. The founder of Slicker Roundabout probably won't be too impressed, but if, if, I, if yeah. I didn't say it, definitely is because he's Francesco. He's Italian, so <laughs> I can't get away with not saying that. Um, oh, fantastic. If if you had one million pound to spend and just lash out, waste it, what would it be on? One million pound. And you don't have to worry about saving it or anything like that. Just just spend that. What are you going to do with that money? Well, I love spending money. Um, <laughs> I got a lot of practice at that. So one million pound. I, I, I mean, I guess I guess my first thing is to try and craft some kind of experience. That would be, you know, lasting. Like the you know, physicist in you spend. comes out. There he is. Yeah, yeah. Some kind of uh, elaborate experience, maybe involving multiple expensive things breaking. Or I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm, I, like I said, I got young family, so I'm trying to be like, you know, to try and move myself into this vein, like wildly spending a million quid, but like no, no questions asked. Um, I've always, I can't drive a car. Um, I never learned how to drive, never had to learn how to drive. I've always been very fortunate in that sense. And and I've always wanted to drive a big monster truck. I don't know why. It's a, the child Massive in me. monster truck. So, uh, so I'd have probably spent a lot of money buying a lot of stuff in a big monster truck to just drive over it. That's something I've wanted to do since I was like two years old. So I'd love to do that.
That is quite interesting. That is definitely quite interesting. Okay, last question. If you were to be able to solve one global crisis, just 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 one, what would it be? What would you choose? Well, I, I mean, like it's getting getting kind of deep all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> well, just one. What so, would it be? Uh, well, so like I mean, I feel like I feel like fundamentally, like dealing with the inequality in the world would solve pretty much everything. So you know, the inequality between nations, the inequality between people, you know, naturally there's a massive you know climate change issue that that's going on now. And, but in essence, a lot of things boil down to inequality. So, you know, I've had to pick one. Maybe if we can deal with inequality, a lot of things will fall out in the wash. That's fantastic. That's that 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 that's very that's very sweet. That is that is very that is very touching. Jay, thank you very much indeed. It has been an absolute pleasure. I'm sure yeah. uh, everybody who listens to this will agree later on. Um, <laughs> hopefully, by um, the time of the event, they would have heard it as well. So. Go on, Fantastic! Sorry. I listen. I really, enjoy, I really enjoyed myself. So appreciate. It. Thank time. you very much. Well, look, we look forward to having you again at the event. Until then, have a lovely Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year in advance. Enjoy it with the family, which I'm pretty sure you will. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I look forward to catch up with you in the New Year again. Cheers, myself. I had a great time. Thanks. Thank you very much. Take care.